I am delighted to welcome an amazing guest to our show today. Hannah Maruyama is an entrepreneur, advocate, author, and social media star. She is also a rebel and a friend bucker. You'll hear more about that in a few minutes. She is the founder of Degree Free, which helps parents and their 16 to 20 year olds create custom career roadmaps that don't require them to buy college degrees. Along with her husband, Ryan, Hannah runs at Degree Free on TikTok and all other social channels, which have created over 100 million views, along with the Degree Free podcast. Hannah also co-wrote the Degree Free Way workbooks that help 16 to 20 year olds build the lives they want. Welcome, Hannah. So great to have you on our show. That was some intro. I am so excited to talk to you both today. <laughs> yeah, well, I i mean, we have been really excited and the team uh, behind our show at, at um, Your Tango have been kind of, I'm not going to lie, kind of obsessed and like fanning, girl fanning and boy fanning out all over you. So we've got a million questions and thanks for being on our show. I'm going to start with this. I referenced you as a rebel and trend bucker because it seems like there's just that much more and more pressure on young young adults, you know, teens and, and young adults to not just go to college, but to go to the best college. Don't worry about the price tag. And you're telling them not to. Why is this? So this is the fundamental problem, I believe, in the U.S. right now is parents are going which college should we pay as opposed to do we need to buy degrees at all? And that Run. is the problem. We're starting with the box already checked. We are not thinking through what their ultimate life goals are and whether or not purchasing a degree both in time and money is going to be worth it for the ultimate type of life that 16 to 20 year olds want to live. And the downstream result of that is $1.7 worth, $1.7 trillion dollars worth of student loan debt and a lot of crushed dreams people who feel like they're boxed into choices they made when they were 17 or 18 years old because the loans are bankruptcy exempt so it is a very high risk decision that we are forcing kids to make extremely young so that is my answer to that and in and, and it really is i mean to your point it's a it it just it is so presumed for so many people they're not even asking should i go to college they're saying to your point which college, and again, for the vast number of kids, it's going to the best college, doesn't matter how, what it costs, how much uh, it puts them in debt, and so forth. And, and to your point, I didn't realize that student loans are, you said, bankruptcy-proof. Oh, or, yeah. That's uh -huh. the big problem. If they weren't, it would be a t an entirely different risk calculation. But it's so funny. I was just talking about this to somebody because my personal philosophy is that, and, and you folks are well, you know, you folks are well-versed mm -hmm. in this because you watch mm -hmm. my content, but it's college if necessary. It is the last educational product you buy. It should never be the first one. It takes the most time. It costs the most money. And if you think about it, that those transitional years from 17 to about 23, you know, depending on if your child goes to college young or a little bit older, you are burning. You're locking up the freest years of their life, the healthiest years of their life. And they're, they're, really the most energetic ones as well, right? They have no family commitments. A lot of times they don't have pets. Usually they don't have health problems yet. And so we're locking them down and saying, you have to be actively bleeding money during this time instead of allowing them to take entry-level jobs and work. Because the thing is, and this is the biggest thing, I'm all about the risk calculation. And that's why a lot of people, when they watch my content, they just think I'm telling people to not go to college. I've actually never said that. Not once. People could... I have posted, I think I have roughly 1,500 uh, TikToks that I've posted over the last few years. There's thousands of hours of me talking. I have never once told anyone not to go to college. I said, don't buy degrees unless you need them. And that's a very uh, specific okay, okay. definition. Okay, but hang on. That, that's important. Don't buy degrees unless you need them. But based on your calculations, only 7.7% .7 of people actually need degrees. If they want to be a civil engineer, if they want to be a surgeon, if they want to be a doctor, if they actually need that Legal licenses. degree legal license but for everybody else you're basically saying don't go to college. i mean like the yes what is that 92.3 percent you're saying don't go yep i'm saying don't go right out of high school that's insane that's oh, an insane okay. thing to do because if you do want to go so then there's the different risk calculation right education college is not education 
college is a it, college is not a synonym for education. It is an educational product, and colleges and universities have done a bang up job making it so that people cannot distinguish those two things. So now, if you criticize college, if you criticize the academic industrial complex at all, you are anti intellectual. You are anti education, which is not true. And the fact that people have that closed off mindset is really just indicative of the failure of colleges to teach critical thinking as well. But that's a whole other <laughs> issue. Yeah, right? uh, that, the the fact, yeah. getting meta fast. <laughs> Yeah. So, Hannah, I'm writing a book right now that's about to be completed that's about teenage boys, okay? And so we, part of that was we had a panel of 85 boys ages 10 to 23 was our oldest, mostly around 15 to 16. And we, every chapter we asked them a question, which was, what do you wish parents knew about this or that, right? So we have activities and sports, education, all that stuff. And so many of our high achieving boys on our panel were like, I wish my parents knew that my grades and what I do in high school don't decide who I am as a person. Like so many of them felt like their parents look at them when they're not getting straight A's, when they're not, you know, taking the SAT for the fourth time. And they're like disappointing to their parents. I mean, we come at it wanting the best for our kids. We want our kids to have a secure foundation and a solid base and a great education. And we don't realize how much we, it's almost like we're sabotaging them in a way because they have to be perfect year after year after year, you know? So one that, thing I and like And that what definition saying, of perfection yeah. is, is yes. very one dimensional. And we've talked about this very. on a couple of other occasions where it's like, you look at an SAT score, you look at an essay. I think they try to get it through essays and you look at grades but all, but even even your essays. I mean, unless you're paying somebody to help with your essays, or you're a gifted writer, even even. And if you're asking the wrong questions, let's face it, you're gonna get the wrong answer, right? So we are creating a really unfair level playing field, unlevel playing field for so many kids that don't fit those molds. Yes, and, it's so much about wealth. It's yeah. so much about who can throw the wealth. Or even just the family or as energy. a traditional learner or right. I mean, it's just yep. in a yes. lot of ways, socioeconomically and, and so forth. And it, it, yeah. So, OK, Hannah, you've got I know you got feedback. Let it rip. Oh, I have like three. So the first one is that that is the socioeconomic factor is so important. People have uh, people are not understanding that what's happening with the colleges and universities. They are white labeling a result that has literally nothing to do with them. Nothing. They have no impact whatsoever. Colleges and universities accept. 77% of people who hold bachelor's degrees come from the top 50% of income distribution. You can't tell me that it's not their parents. It's not their family. It's not their connections. It's not their capital. That's the result. And colleges are going, we'll accept you. And then we're going to take credit for a result that is that is directly related to the 18 years prior and has nothing to do with the college, is in fact in spite of the college, is in spite of them burning their time, is in spite of them making them sit through years of pointless classes to do things that don't help them get to their goals either. And then Joanna, to your point, oh my goodness, the boys are getting screwed. It is it, like I have seen the most drastic turnarounds in my, so I run a launch program. And basically what that is, is where I work one-on-one -on -one with kids for four sessions. I do a ton and me and my team do a ton of research on the back end, finding things that help them figure out what they want to get in life and educational design. But Joanna, have you read that that uh, British Psychology Journal study about the last hundred years of education? S teachers hate boys. They hate boys. Men, oh, it, women. Yeah. It's yeah. been a and disaster it's understandable for decades. It's understandable because if yeah. you wanted to accomplish a sit down, be quiet task and this people can get upset at this all they want. But it's true. Do you want a group of 35th grade girls or 35th grade boys? I want girls. Yeah. Yeah. And and it's we've been watching it change. My oldest son started kindergarten in 2000 in, in 2010. And my youngest child started kindergarten last year, 2023. And the difference in how we have been restraining kids and it's not just boys but it does tend to come out of boys it's just those wiggly kids and it's it is so emotionally detrimental to assume that every child has to be on the same path my middle son is at a high school that has an auto shop program it has a um, hospitality program it has a child care program it has all these things my son's in the sports medicine program where they come out with certifications from high school and the kids that are in those programs are thriving. So I think you're so on track to get this. It's so important to get that message out. It's important for the emotional well-being 
of these kids that they know they don't have to fit that high achiever academic mode yeah. in order to be but successful. Also, there are some that are high achievers and we're burying them. And and that's the thing is I think that all kids can be high achievers in their sphere of success. And that's the thing is you talked about success. What is that? And that's the biggest problem we have as a society is success is getting what you want. That is what success is. If your kids want and on your to own have terms, a... right? And that's, yes, I think that's the... what that's yes. your premise. Your starting premise is your your most families are saying, OK, it's a it's preordained rather than doing what you're doing, which is what really is the right path. And when I think about it, as long as you have a connected phone or device, you have access to an like an unprecedented amount of opportunity to be really educated. Yes. And so this idea, yes. I think before, I mean, let's face it, going even back to hundreds of years ago when books were the province of the church, like you had to know somebody, right? Or you had to be, you really, it was the ruling elite classes. And so I feel like there's been a, a um, it's been synonymous with, with wealth and success and the upper echelons. They were, they had a, I mean, even like in, I feel like, you know, Indian culture, the Brahmins, they were the yes, ones that had correct. access to, Very the, well to the knowledge. Is it? And now that's been totally democratized. And so it feels like there's just this disconnect, which you're identifying this big gap in our consciousness that's saying, hey, so many of us for decades have been following this, the American dream, go to college, get a better job, create a better lifestyle. And yet there's a shadow side that you've identified where before you could you could go to, you know, you could go to a, a trade school or, or or college and not bury you in in debt. But as the the costs of college have outpaced um inflation in, you know, in our job, in our, you know, rather in our, you know, increases. And we were joking at your tango. Uh, there was something from the William Sonoma catalog a couple of years ago, like a $1,500 mini fridge. So not only is it the cost yeah, of- for dorms. Yeah. Yes. The cost of the education itself, then you add room and board and then you add, it's like you have Transportation. to have- Transportation. I'm doing it right now. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. yeah. People so we had say- a yeah, go, 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 oh, go for it. Well, go for I it. just say what you're going to say, and then I have a question that's kind of a little bit deeper. <laughs> oh, I just have par people all the time. A lot of the pushback I get is people saying, well, you know what? You would be spending living expenses anyway. I'm like, those are not the same as the living expenses you spend on campus. I am fully convinced, fully convinced that if you go into college at 17, 18 years old, you are a teenager that entire time because they crystal it crystallizes you because you're around a bunch of other teenagers. You're not around a bunch of other working people. You're not around a bunch of people of diverse ages and diverse backgrounds. You're actually not. And that's one of the other things people constantly say, well, fine, college may not be worth it. It, but it, where would else would I get exposed to diversity? Kellogg's, uh, Kellogg at Northwestern just did a study that shows that actually college students are exposed to less cross-cultural, less cross-racial interactions than they would be if they were in the wild. Yeah, that's so a strange that. thing. <laughs> so the, speaking of diversity, one of the biggest concerns I've always had about the way that we sort of the educated or people maybe middle, upper middle class have talked about trade schools and non-college opportunities is that often we talk about it for others for other people. And it's almost a way in which we go, well, we need people in more trades. We need people coming out with different certifications. And what we mean is other people's we kids. We don't want to offer other people opportunities to go to college. And by that, I mean, first generation students. I mean, especially students of color. Probably um, my, my, yeah, on, people that have immigrated to the U.S., right? Yeah. What they really want, when we're really being honest about it, is people are saying we really don't want to give opportunities to black and brown kids, you know, especially uh, Latino kids. And there is this sort of uh, a message there. Where it's like, well, we don't really need to find ways to pull more kids up into college because we need people in the trades. And it ends up being kind of a furthering division, almost race based um, kind of way of keeping people down. How do you do that? Problem. But that's Work a perception. That. But is that? But I feel like you're going to say that's not necessarily true. 
right? So this is part of the where it, w- the real impact and the real breakdown, because I am about the stats, about the data. All I do is read this kind of stuff. All I do is read these studies and I look for things that other people aren't seeing. So I totally see that. But what a lot of people are mistaking for, I think, race and ethnicity is actually socioeconomic status. Yes, yes, yeah, exactly. It's, it's well, you can't bracket. pull them apart. They're, they're really cannot. hard to pull apart. So I'm totally yep. with you. Yeah, but yeah. I'm totally, you have seen people just, oh, we need electricians, we need plumbers. And I love, like, I like in principle what Mike Rowe has done, but I always say it on TikTok. I say, I am not Mike Rowe. I am not saying your kid should not buy a college degree. Your kid should instead go be an electrician. I am saying your kid can go be a machine learning engineer. That is what I'm saying. I'm saying you do not have to buy permission from a college or a university to do that. Sam Altman, the CEO of OpenAI, is degree free. And you see that with all of these oh, big Sam tech Alvin, founders. Oh, Sam wait a minute, degree free. He doesn't have a college degree? No. What? Oh my God, no. how did I not know that? Yeah. That's amazing. Okay, yeah. so that's a testament to what you're doing, Hannah, because holy cow, you know, it's he is- It's starting your kids early. You see that yeah. with Zuckerberg, you see that with Gates, you see that with all of these really, all of these really successful, uh, like Jan Coombe, who's the uh, CEO of WhatsApp, he was a janitor. Janka was a janitor. He's degree free. But you see that they started learning early. That's the thing. They have time in the game. You see that with like really famous celebrities too, Rihanna, Taylor Swift, where people are doing studies and breakdowns. I saw as a college class, I think it was NYU where they it's so funny how you have to buy a degree to be successful unless you're really successful and then they'll just turn around yeah. and give you a college degree. They just degree. give it to you for free. Uh-huh. Right. Cool. Just to rope you back in. Just to rope you back in. Because like, oh yeah, you know, you again, white labeling, right? Oh, look at these successful people. Taylor Swift, she's a graduate of NYU. No, (laughs) that's not what happened. She's been working since she was 14. That's what happened, right? She's been practicing her skill set since she's 14 years old. So it seems like the way, when I always try and reframe this about like, I love this phrase degree free, being degree free is it's, it's what we want for equality is for everybody to have an equal opportunity to choose whether they're going to need the degree or whether they're going to need a different type of education or, you know, progress path. And what we, with the goal isn't, oh, we just need more electricians. It's more like, how do we make sure everybody can get to med school if that's what they're destined for and they're willing to do the work and what they want? And how can everybody also find it acceptable to go a degree-free route, regardless of income and race, right? Yes. And there's been a creep, a gradual creep. I call call it paper creep. But basically over the last few decades, you can see where the college is. And it's so unfortunate that every time the government gets involved, they just ruin things. And everybody can see that. Every time they get involved in anything, it just gets more complicated, more expensive. And that's what happened with the Higher Education Act. 1965, they said, we're going to subsidize student loans. Okay. 1965, 7.4% of the population had college degrees at this point. Almost all of those degrees were doctors, lawyers, engineers, (laughs) things that require it for legal licensure. By 1976, 13.8% of the population had bought college degrees. And that, at that point, this is 11 years, 11 years in, they had to make student loans bankruptcy exempt. The ROI was negative then. We have been running on steam since 1976. And people don't realize, right? Because if if, if it was profitable, if, if, if people were paying them back and they weren't defaulting, why would they have had to do that? They wouldn't. They had to. They had to because people were all the defaulting on the loans at an astronomic rate. And so they had to intervene at a legisl- on a legislative scale. Well, let me let me rewind for a moment, just going back to um, some of those incredible degree free examples and just dig in a little more. You write from tech to trades, machine learning developers, midwives, drone pilots, sommeliers. Those are people that pour fancy wines, if I'm not mistaken. Um Dog grooming, cloud computing architects, organ tra- transplant techs, watchmakers, salvage divers, animators, any job under the sun that doesn't require that kind of prof- professional licensure, even um, regular pilots, like commercial pilots. And so I our, our great, uh, brilliant outcomes, I mean, landscape architects, like you name it, like so many opportunities for people to do brilliant, meaningful, credible, money-making work. Future and, building work. Yeah. Yeah. And um, and so I just, I, I feel like we've just jumped in without even kind of giving our listeners and viewers this context of what you're talking about and how people can make serious bank 
right? By by choosing that path. And so I just I really wanted to to give that context before we go too much deeper because this isn't a hey, we're, you know, Hannah's over here dunking on colleges and and putting out all those yeah. sort of you know, statistics without saying, and the alternative is, and I'm going to give a little, Everything. Um, yeah, just a little sunshine to your, to your workbooks as you know, you've gone through them on oh, TikTok. You. And by the way, my kids, I have two boys, they're 11 and 14. And so even what you're saying, saying before, like it, it can be really tough to be a boy in the public school system that is high energy, right? Let's just face it. You know, if you don't, if you're not just kind of quiet and sitting in the mold, and so I love even your workbook. It's like what I, the big aha that I had in, in listening to your your TikToks and as you, um, as I've gotten to know your work, you don't know what you don't know. And for you to say that this is, this is expected, is prescribed for so many, the vast majority of Americans, this is prescribed. But if you don't know what you don't know, then doing the work you're doing where you're really, you know, and that's why I call you an advocate, trying to help people understand that there is in the, you know, and I'm also, okay, also full disclosure, Tulane uh, engineering degree, Columbia Business School, right? So like I I bought the Kool-Aid, drank the Kool-Aid, like did it all. So we talk in business school speak, BATNA, your best alternative to a negotiated uh, out, uh, agreement, I think. And so I always think BATNA, it's like, well, if you're not getting the outcome you want, what's the, what's the alternative to that? So if if you're not coming from a wealthy family or you're not, you know, able, if you say, listen, I'm just willing to revisit going to college and that your BATNA is, I can, and as you describe, I can get into a career that places me in a job with a higher than the medium, the average median income for a college graduate, something that I love. That's a really good BATNA for a lot of people. And I say that because a lot of people just, for whatever reason, they really aren't exploring that. And that's where you found this amazing white spot. And you're you're telling people, hey, explore this. You don't know, we don't know. I'm going to tell you a funny little anecdote. Over the weekend, we took my, my uncle was in a, we were all at a wedding. My uncle was in from Minnesota. He had never tried Thai, my husband's Indian. And so we lo- love Asian food. We took him for Thai food. He was very nervous. And when I tell you, we blew his mind. He was, and he's a little older. He was like, "Oh my God, these dumplings! Oh my God, this!" And then he tried the mango sticky rice. He's like, "My life has changed." You know, we send him back to Minnesota, a new man, and we called him the Thai guy. And I say that because it's like you don't know what you don't know, and whether it's you know your palate being uh, you know sort of uh, revitalized through something tantalizing, or saying, "Hey, I really can with with." so much confidence. I can choose a path, but it takes, that's why I called you a rebel and a trend bucker. It takes a lot of chutzpah for you to advocate for that. Cause I'm guessing, I'd love to hear the, just some of the blowback that you've gotten in all sincerity. And it takes a lot as a kid. I mean, it's for kids and parents, let's face it. Everybody is asking the same question. Where'd you apply? Where are you going to college? For somebody to say, it's like you're a sole voice out there saying, I'm going to a trade school or I'm not doing that. I'm doing this other thing. So talk about talk about some of those challenges people are facing. And then I also want to hear some of the success stories, because I, I do think, yes, we've talked about the sommeliers and drone pilots and those amazing outcomes. But t- I want to hear some of the examples of real people who took who courageously took that leap, who went against the grain, bucked the system and said, you know, what, mom and dad, this might disappoint you or the parents say, you know what? This may sound crazy, but I really think this is a better option for you, right? And again, it is a very big challenge and change for, I would say, for the vast majority of families that are, um, that have kids 16 to 20. That was like 14 questions all in one. Take which one you want to start. (laughs) Okay. So the first thing is I have noticed that, so I have a couple of examples of that, actually. One, I find that I have two types of parents that come to me. Two, I get two types. Um, one of them sees what I'm saying and they know from experience that it's right because they are still paying off their student loans and they are prospectively going to be paying off their student loans until they're 80. Uh, so those parents are one type. The other type is the type that has uh, earmarked earmarked spend for education and they have a lot of it. And they go, wait, do we have to do this? My kid really doesn't want to sit through sociology. That's not what they want to do. 
And I find that it's kind of, it's interesting to see too the, uh, the, the different types of people because in both of those types, I have, I, I just had a kid come through and he has a good story. He has a good story. I'll tell his story. Um, his mom is a licensed uh, is a licensed therapist from Princeton. That's her background, right? License, lic- she works with kids. That's her job. <laughs> that was her job. And then the on the other side, I have people that are, you know, they're making, you know, one hundred fifty, two hundred thousand dollars a year. They're business owners. They're in real estate, you know, or they just own they own a small local business that does really well. And they're like, I don't think, you know, they own a they had one. Well, they they owned a little kids uh, gymnastics, you know, gymnastic professional gymnastic coach owner. That's what she does. And for no reason does her child, she just sees, she doesn't have to do that to get where she wants to go. And so they're receptive to the message because they already know it's true. But the other group is the type that's steeped in go to college, go to college, go to college. And it's a waste of their kid's time because they have all of this money to leverage and they can just spend, right? Most of us don't have that ability. But if my parents did that, if there is no money for me to go to college, zero, zero dollars, I have three other siblings. There's no money for me to go to college. I shouldn't have been there. I was from that lower 50%. And if I had gone, my life would have been not good. I'm just saying I had no goal. I had no idea what I was doing. I didn't want to be there. I didn't like most of the classes and couldn't see the function. That was a losing recipe for me to get into journalism. You don't need a degree to write words. (laughs) You can just write them. (laughs) Anyway, but uh, basically... It was so interesting what I noticed from a kid I recently worked with who falls into that into that uh, educational spend bracket was his mom said that once she revealed this plan to the other parents, and this is one of the only private school kids I've worked with. I usually work with public school kids. I actually don't I don't have that many private school kids that I work with, um, just the skew of who's apl- of who applies. And uh, so it was interesting because she said that when oh, let's call her uh, Ellen. So when Ellen showed her son's plan to the other moms, they all just went, what is that? You can mm-hmm. do that. They didn't know. They didn't. They exactly. don't have you don't vocational know you don't creativity. Know. Yeah. They don't have vocational creativity. That's what Ryan and I called it. And I will say Ryan came up with this because Ryan, my husband, is a Hawaiian Japanese comes from a background where there is not vocational creativity. He's grew up in Hawaii. He's been there his whole life. They, the, the mindset of especially people who come from Asian backgrounds is, and you know, because of your husband, it's there's one of three jobs, uh, doctor, lawyer, finance. Those are your jobs. Pick or one. engineer. Engineer is <laughs> a fourth one. Or engineer. Yeah. Yeah, or yeah, engineer, yeah. yes. Yeah, or yeah, engineer. Yeah. And, you know, they say that and then their kids just go, okay, I guess. And been the only option for those jobs, aside from law, where you can still read the law in four states, that's an aside for people. But um, yeah, this, the only options for them are to buy college degrees, but they didn't think about what their kids want down the line. And I see that play out really poorly, especially if the kids don't want that type of life or don't want that type of work. And now the only way for them to pay off their loans and live, uh, be able to afford to live is to work in these jobs that demand so much of them that maybe don't fit into the way they wanted to live. And anyway, that's an aside. But that was the thing is parents don't know what they don't know exactly as you said. And that's vocational creativity. The good news about this is that and this is why we wrote these workbooks. Parents can figure this out. The only difference, the only difference between me, me and a parent is a parent needs to spend a lot more time, right? I've been doing this for years. I spend all my time doing this. All I do is think about this. But parents can do this. All you have to do is think about things, think about careers and jobs that are deeper than what you see on the surface, right? Because if you were watching this podcast and you didn't know that that Brian was here, that's a that's a job that's it's almost like an invisible job. You don't see he, he, if he does his job oh, and well. Brian's you don't our see producer, him. right? Who is behind yes. the scenes? And by the way, he does yes. have a great uh, a great uh, degree, <laughs> but yeah. but he wouldn't need absolutely. To. Yeah, yeah, yes. But exactly, and, exactly to your point. Yeah. And a little deeper than that, go who? So when Brian's done, does he send the stuff to a video editor? Right. You think deeper. You think who's the sound engineer? Who's the post processor? Right. You think who writes the scripts? Who's the research team? You know, if this was uh, if this was like a daytime TV show, then who does the makeup? Right. How much do those people make? Okay, And then are there people that are distributors or buyers for the products that those makeup artists use? Right. And just keep going deeper and deeper and deeper, always further in. And that's how you practice vocational creativity. You look at what you see. Right. You look at these bookshelves I have back here. The, some some CAD drafter somewhere made these. And then a prototype fab 
made them and figured them out. And then when the machine parts broke to manufacture them, there was a machinist that did that. It's it's all in there, you know, it's all these, you just have to look around you and see what's deeper, what's past what you see. Because the reason that so many kids are getting poor results is because when we when we did research on this, we found that kids only know like six to eight jobs on average. And they're all ones that you can see. They're all, t t top of the list is teacher, right? Teacher, I have the girl, I have the girls and the boys spread if you guys want to hear them right now. Yeah, yeah, let's hear I it. I have the list. So yeah. the girls, and this is not going to surprise you guys at all, teacher, social worker, psychologist, nurse, doctor, interior designer, and photographer. Only two of those don't require the purchase of a college degree to do legally. And that is terrible because most jobs don't require the purchase of a college degree. So we're saying in order to do a job that you want to do because they're the only jobs they know about, they have to buy degrees. And that's we're setting them up for failure because they just don't know. And information is the answer, is the cure to this to this kind of stuff. Um, and then the boys are teacher, veterinarian, doctor, nurse, YouTuber, influencer, lawyer, engineer, firefighter. That's what they gamer. Got. Come on, put yeah. gamer up there. That that is gotta I put, just. I kind be... of factor that in with yeah. YouTuber, YouTuber, influencer. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. Like, yeah. Streamer. streamer, Twitch All these guys streamer. Be, yeah. yeah, they think they're all going to be uh, professional gamers. Well, what I what I love about what you're talking about is I feel like it puts agency back in the hands of the kids and families and, you know, and, and, um, out, out of a, a broken for-profit system, even if they're not for profit, let's face it, they're operating like profit systems because they cost so much. And I always think, um, you can't have emotional freedom without economic freedom. And if you don't have emotional freedom, it's hard to raise a healthy, um, stable family. It's, it's hard to raise healthy, stable kids. And again, you know, I mean, let's face it, there are, there's maladaption across the socio socioeconomic spectrum, but it's a lot harder if you don't have the resources and and you're you're strapped in, in student debt. And it's been interesting in, in preparing for you, Hannah, just somewhat I, what we've been talking about as a team and, and with friends, even Brian chimed in with, you know, he got a great degree. He's well into his career and still has uh, tens of thousands of student debt. I mean, and on and on. And like, you know, just so many people do. And so it's like that, that, and as you say, that, that burden that people are unwittingly carrying. And even I think Brian, in fact, what I meant to actually add to that is Brian, very bright guy, um, got all these scholarships and was like, oh, this is great. I'm going to be able to get out of here, you know, with, with, without this burden. And I think, again, this is a well-kept, terrible secret for, and we're, we haven't reached there yet because our kids are only 11 and 14, but it's right in front of us, that you think you're getting a scholarship, but it, there are so many hidden costs of expensive books. And and if you're getting, okay, your tuition paid for, but it's room and board. And and so even if you're getting uh, help, you still often leave with a very big financial burden. And depending on the job you get, you don't... Um, like you say, it's a burden you carry for a long time. Also, uh, yeah, no, I'm still 40K in debt from college. And I had 100% bright futures and grants and um, a prepaid tuition thing. Where did so, you go? If you don't mind uh, me University of Central Florida. Mm, oh, yeah. My University of Miami is bad, too. Yeah. Is, I've seen them. I've seen them. It that also, was crazy. It also got me bad because, again, like you were saying, uh, I had started as a computer engineer and then switched into like a more um, digital artistic space, um, digital media. It was still very on the cutting edge when I did it. I'm 33. So like things were all constantly shifting. Um, so I did have more classes maybe than was expected or whatever, but it turned into everything's free. You're totally paid for it to, oh, by the way, here's your 40K in debt. Enjoy that. So Yep. <laughs> yep. No, I that's mean, I'm 40K 10 years later. So, I mean, I've paid off a bunch of it. So, you know. Yeah, let me um, let me sort of segue to Isaac. And so I just, I was a, on a little bit of, of a rant. <laughs> uh, Isaac, Hannah, All Hannah, good. Isaac. So, uh, so, so, yeah, so there are, I mean, and I, I actually do want to talk about the pros. As, as I said a little while ago, I have, you know, I have credentials. A lot. I mean, having an engineering degree, MBA, et cetera. There have been a lot of things that have benefited me. Um, but before we continue with our conversation, we have a super special extra guest today. Isaac is here. Isaac, you're 19, right? Yes, you're I am. in college. Joanna's darling son. Uh, Hannah has agreed to do 
like just give us a taste for what it's like when you're counseling uh, a teenager like like Isaac. So I'm gonna just turn it over to you, Hannah. Sure. Uh, so Isaac, basically, uh, do you know what I do? That's the first thing. No. Okay, cool. So basically what I do is I ask a bunch of questions and then I do a bunch of work for people your age to help them figure out what types of jobs get them what they want in life and then what to learn to do those things. So I actually, I don't necessarily counsel. I more work, I would just work for you. That's how it works actually. So my job is just ask you questions and then I go do a bunch of research for you. So what I'm going to do is I'm, I'm going to ask you a couple shortened questions of what I usually ask. And some of them are a little tough because I'm cutting you to the end. Normally, I start with easier questions and they get progressively harder. Uh, so what are you What are you in school for now? Um, currently, I am an exercise science major in my four-year program. And I'm going to a three-year graduate program for physical therapy or sports medicine. Okay. Okay, cool. So basically, I'm going to start based on that. Um, I'm going to start asking you a soft. I'm going to start with an easy question. Uh, the first one is if you could wake up tomorrow and you could master any three skills or hobbies immediately, things that you think are cool, things that bring you joy, or things that you think could make you money or income, what would those three things be? Um, uh, I'm going to start with I'm going to finish mastering the guitar because I've put in four and a half to five years in that already. And if I could speed up that process, it would help my music career a bunch. I don't want a career in it. It's, I think it's just a fun hobby. I think it'd be good. Um, maybe next I'd master my javelin because I'm a javelin thrower at my school and I'm really bad at it right now. And I need to get a lot better at it so I can, you know, go to go to state and all of that for for uh, for Division three. And then um, I don't think you, uh, there's a skill of making money. I think that you. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, yeah. Like getting right into the career earlier. Hey, mom, you're not allowed to chime in. <laughs> hey, mom, you're being like me. We could do stocks. This yeah. the skill Trading of gambling stocks. with stocks. That'd be pretty yeah. cool. Or That's... can I do the skill of blackjack? Absolutely, I think that would also work pretty well. There's no wrong answers. And if you had that skill to count cards, then yeah, you could make a lot of money doing that. Yeah. So you really javelin, could. javelin, blackjack, and a guitar. Those are the three. Yeah, that's yeah. perfect. Okay, all right. And then uh, I'm going to ask you a couple more. I'm a couple more. You, ha, you're, you're good? You're good for a couple more? Oh, yeah, I'm good. Okay, cool. All right, thanks for being willing to do this too because normally this is uh, this is all one-on-one, -on -one, so he's doing, a, he's doing a good job. Oh, yeah, of course. Okay, this one's a little harder. You may have to think about this, but if you could try a job for a day, and I'm going to preface this with any job in the whole world, so you could be the pilot that flies people out to the Antarctic substations, or you could be an elephant trainer, or you could be the guy at SpaceX that presses the buttons that sets off the rockets. I've also gotten answers like nurse or teacher because people would like to try those jobs for a day, but they don't necessarily want to become one. So is there any job that you want to try for one day that you're interested in? You know, thinking about it, I feel like I'm really curious about how miserable a job being a chemist would be because I, I, I think it seems a lot of fun, but now that I've taken a lot of those classes, I'm wondering if it's as fun as like being in those classes are because they're not fun. But I feel like the people in those jobs like chalk it up to being a lot of fun. And I feel like it would dissuade a lot of my ideas about, you know, career paths. And it's just like, oh, well, these people truly have something wrong with them and they love them they love it so much that it like makes them want to do it what do you think you know you think it's big chemistry trying to market to you and, and make it seem like it's fun <laughs> no i think that it's i think you would like reinforce the idea that there's just something for everybody and i feel like there's a lot of nicheness in jobs and it would keep them from it would keep me from like i don't know thinking that i could do anything because I feel like there's a job for me that would be that's like perfect. And I, don't I feel like know. If, I feel like if I say like, oh, I could do anything, I feel like that's not exactly accurate because I could not do a lot of things. And I think seeing that, because I, I know that I'm I have a skill in writing because I'm it's very easy for me, but I hate it a lot. I can't stand writing, I'd rather be doing anything else. So I know like I feel like if I saw someone do that job and like could do that job for a day I feel like it would like help me feel like oh if I find something that I enjoy it really helped me 
like understand why I love to do it. Because if I do a job that I hate, I understand why I hate it. That was one of the most thorough answers I have ever gotten to that question because I usually have to ask why afterwards. But you explain the why very well and very thoroughly. Nice job. <laughs> and process this of elimination, what you don't want to do, right? Yes. And I always say ruling out is more important than ruling in. So last question. This is the hard one. It's four questions. You game? Okay. Yeah. Okay. All right. So usually what I ask, and this is not the final thing. It's one of the things I ask. So, uh, and feel free to answer this question however you want. But if you fast forward 15 years into the future, that would put you at, uh, what? I don't make me do math in public. How old would you be in 15 years? <laughs> um, I'd be 34. 30, 34, right? Can you picture it in your mind? I hope. I, I um, think you're right. So if you're 34, what does your family life look like? Who's there? Where do you live? What do you live in? Do you have dogs, cats, llamas? No, I hate, I hate these questions. I know. Because usually there's a lot more lead up to this one. I don't usually ask it three questions. <laughs> oh, I bet. <laughs> you're being a good, you're going to, you're being a good sport though. Um, oof. I, I don't know. I, I truly still see myself as like where I am now. It's hard to s say like, cause I, I'm definitely going to change when I'm 34 to an, a lot of extent, but to the extent I am now, I would imagine myself, I don't know, focusing on my career in a two bedroom house. For, where is which, that? Which, which, which is what I want right now. That sounds very nice to me. That but sound pretty good. that's definitely not going to what, what I'm going to want in two, three, four years. So I, I leave that open. Okay. That's pretty good. Do you know, and this is the last thing I'll do. Um, do you know where you want to live after you graduate? Oh, Washington. Oh, I love it there. That's where I'm going to college. I love it. Okay. Because the I don't weather. care where. Yeah. The weather's, I love it. Do you know what sort of income you want to try to make when you get out of school? Or what, what type of income would you like? That's actually a better, that's a better question. Let's ask it like that instead. I'm trying to calibrate um, for you specifically. 100K or above. That's all I can really hope for. And then do you know what type of schedule? A... Schedule? Um, yeah, like if you could design the type of schedule you have in a week, when would you work, right? Because we all got to work, so when would you work if you could pick? Um, Weekdays, so if I had to, Monday through Friday. If I could choose, though, I'd do Monday, Thursday, and then maybe three days off. That sounds nice. I'll, I like to keep busy, but I feel like once I get too busy, I want like a three-day vacation really badly. So I know I'm going to have to come into work. I know I have to come into work on weekends sometimes. That's what I have to do now. So, I mean, if I could choose, like, on my, on my less busy weeks, I'd have a three-day weekend. That'd be nice. That three day three day work weeks or four day work weeks in that uh, three days you can do a lot of living in three days. And then my last question is, what is your ideal work environment? Do you want to work from home? Do you want to work with other people? Do you want to be able to have the option to work in an office or or with other people? And then sometimes the option to work alone. Yeah, I I learned this because with my job I had the option to work from home, and then I had to work in my offices as well. Um, working from home seems awesome as you have to actually do the work and you end up not doing it and you know, doing anything else but work until you're like, it's the, the last minute. If I force myself to drive 45 minutes to the offices and get the work done there, I'm still, I mean, I'm still alone in the offices, but you know, my, my, my boss comes in sometimes and she, uh, and we'll talk. It's kind of nice there because it's like, I know I have to do the work. There's nothing else to do, but stare at the printer while I do my printing. So I definitely choose to go work in an office, but maybe it'd be nice to have it close to my house. And then if it's like, if I don't have any work to do, or like if it's something that I truly could get done in like an hour or two hours, I don't want to be forced to stay there because then I would get resentful for sure. Yep. Yep. So that's basically, those are my questions and you did a really good job on the spot with no lead up because that's tough. Those are tough questions to answer with no with no lead up to them. So thank you, Isaac. I appreciate that. So basically what I do is like I take those um 
those criteria that you just gave me, your location, your income, your schedule, and then if you had to prioritize them in terms of which one was the most important to you, which one would you say is number one? Probably say where I live. Another reason for that is that I can probably be happy anywhere as long as I have like certain friends or the right environment. No, nope, that's really important. A lot of people don't think about that, actually. What did you say is number two? Money. Mm -hmm. And then three and four, if you had to pick. I'd probably say work schedule comes third and then work environment. No, I'd say work environment comes third and then work schedule comes fourth. Mm -hmm. Cool. Good job. Thanks. Digs in. Yeah. <laughs> and then so Hannah, do you, you normally then take, uh, based on that, and I realize, and by the way, thanks and props to you, put it, we put you on the spot to do this really compressed exercise, but I That's presume tough, that this would get um, normally um, done in an, just a, an expanded way and you would start to work with your, your clients, parents, and then their, their uh, teen and young adult kids to say, okay, here are some jobs that could match these? I mean, are you actually doing so, that research or, or how does that work? Yeah. So what everybody just saw was a very condensed part of one part of the first part of my process, which is a four part process. It's the initial kickoff. It's the foundation. And then the rest of the process builds on itself. So, and I'll tell Isaac how this usually works. So basically what I do is I usually take all of that stuff and then I go do a ton of research. I look nationally, I look locally, I look anywhere that you want to live and I find, and remote work too, if that fits your criteria. And then I give you a giant list of jobs, most of which you've probably never heard of in your life. And then I just have you go through and eliminate the ones you don't like. That's all you got to do. All you have to do, no homework, no nothing. Just cut the ones you don't like and then tell me why. And then after that, I go out and I take the jobs that made the cut to the third call and that's the skill stack analysis. So what I do is again, local national analysis of jobs that that are for that specific thing. I always ignore degree requirements because they are, in, unless it is legally required, because if it is not a legal requirement, it is a request and it can be ignored and it should be all the time because you never know who people are going to hire. Companies don't hire people that look like the job descriptions. So then I go out and I look at the actual skills. So I look at the most in-demand skills across all of the jobs that I can find for that specific thing, especially, and I do focus on location if, if someone has to work in a fixed location, because like Isaac, that'd be number one, right? So you'd look for jobs in Washington that fit those criteria according to the ones he narrowed from his previous vocational creativity list. And then after I do that, um, I say, hey, this is these are the skills you need to learn. This is any relevant legal licenses or certifications. And then if they do require a degree, because I don't, I don't not do those things. I just make sure that they have a fully informed idea of what's going to be required of them. So then I tell them how long it's going to take. And then they eliminate based on level of interest in learning the skills and then also the amount of time it's going to take them to get to be able to to be hired in their first job doing that. And then after that, I make a career curriculum. So I explain, I'll find resources, I find courses, I find specific schools even, depending on what it is, like midwife apprenticeship programs, or like I said, the, a watchmaker institute, or a coding boot camp. I just put a kid into a MIT, uh, or sorry, not MIT, but a, it was based in California, but there's a there's a machine learning boot camp that he's going to go to. He's going to go a cloud direction and, you know, costs a fraction of what they would have paid for one year of college. But that was his end result. But we based that on the fact that he wanted remote work and he wanted to make over a certain amount of money. And then you optimize for those things. And then you just lay out a clear path to get the skills that they need. And how long does your long... process typically take, Hannah? Like if I would came to you with my son in three years and said, hey, we're thinking about this. What, what should parents expect? So the youngest I will work with is 16. And that's not because I didn't try to work with younger than that, because I do think that time in the game matters a lot. But that's something I think parents can foster and should and should foster. Um, bye, Isaac. Nice to meet Thank you. Thank you, Isaac. <laughs> this is a, what He's a good getting sport. On that. He's getting on his own call. Oh, OK. Well, right okay. now. Good timing. <laughs> Sorry. So how long does the process with you typically take if you're and I realize you also have a workbook, but how long should people expect for that to take with you? Okay, so for me to do this process, um, for me and my research team to do this process, it takes between 30 and 60 days usually. So and that includes scheduling all the, all the calls, right? So I schedule all the calls with the young adult, one through four, four, four one-hour sessions where we actually do the review and I walk them through the process, give them my understanding of what's going on. Um, and then the final calls with the parents. Parents come back on because they need to know. 
I, I give them cost, location, enrollment information, uh, estimated difficulty, all that kind of stuff. And then based on those things, I have the kid narrow to their, this is what I'm going to act on. And so I'll follow this up with a story, which is that uh, the the Princeton therapist oh, that right. I We're spoke back, about. Oh, right. We're back to them. Son, yep. Ellen, I think. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. Ellen. Ellen. Wonderful lady, Ellen. And her son, I'll call him Caleb. Caleb. Caleb was great. He just came in. Um, a lot of kids, especially the boys, I've noticed. And Joey and I, I'm sure you you know exactly what I'm talking about because of your research. As soon as they have direction, they're gone. They're gone. That's all they need. And it's so like I could just cry thinking about this experience because it was just like it was the coolest thing I've ever seen in my life. And uh, basically what happened was uh, so Caleb went through the whole process, went through the lunch program. He went back to back to back. The 19 year olds usually do because they want to get an answer because they want to go. And so he's 30 days in and out. And so at the last session, his parents came back, his mom and his dad came back on, Ellen and her husband. And uh, Caleb, you know, Caleb's in control, right? Because I tell the young adult at the beginning, I'm working for you. This, maybe it's never happened, but I work for you. So you have to give me direction. You have to be invested. I need you to have skin in the game, you know, because it's, it's serious. It's the first time they've given direction to somebody probably working for them. So uh, we come back in and I say, all right, you ready to review these results? So we review the results and based on the type of income you wanted to make, where he wanted to live and the type of work environment that he wanted. So the thing that he ended up, he had automotive, he had a landscape architect, he had uh, actually, he had a, a auto broker on there too, which actually there's a specific school for. He had auctioneer on there. There were so many. There's an auctioneering, there's multiple auctioneering schools. I don't know if you guys knew that. And uh, there was, but there were so many things. He had narrowed it down to, he had elevator repair installer for, that is one of the highest paying trades in the country right now, four-year apprenticeship uh, with a definite path to business ownership also in that. And he ended up narrowing it down to actually fiber optic installer, cable installer. That was the one that he wanted. It fit his fit his goals, fit his location needs. And it's so cool because I go in thinking I know what they're going to pick and I almost never do. I almost never do because I try to be as unbiased as possible. And that was the one he picked. One of the things I started doing was I added example job listings for them because I don't do that part. Well, I kind of do now, but I, I give them example job listings. I give them a resume and I say, this is how you're going to repackage the current skills you already have onto this resume in addition to any you're going to learn. And so I gave him this. This is a Sunday. This call happened on a Sunday afternoon. On Monday, I said, you should apply for that top job, the one right there, the top of the two examples. I said, apply for that job. That's a good company. I did my research on them. I looked all. I looked at all of their stuff, like top rated company. People love them. 401k, uh, WD job, paid training, company car. Great job. And he applies Monday morning. <laughs> they call him back on Tuesday. He goes into a job fair per their request. Wednesday, he's hired. Oh That's my how God. fast that turned Amazing. Was. Oh my God. Yeah. And yeah. this and is, he a, this hang on, this so is a 17, 18 year old, you're saying? Nin 19, 19. 19 year old. Okay. Yeah. Who yeah. was trying to figure it out. And he had gone to trade school. And I'm sorry, but Joanna, again, you probably know exactly what I'm talking about. You, if your son steps out of line when he is six years old, if he steps out of line the wrong way to the wrong person, he'll end up on an IEP being told he's dumb his entire life. It happens all the time. And yeah. this is one of those kids. Learning there's, differences, right? It is. There's mm -hmm. nothing is. He's fine. <laughs> I talk to him for hours and I get this all the time where I get then sometimes I don't want to know. A lot of times I'll tell parents. I'm like, I don't want to t like, please actually don't t like, don't tell me all of their school diagnoses. I'm like, I don't think like actually don't because because their school diagnoses so often parents and they just want to help so much. And their kids have been just oh gone my God, through on the school system. Oh, my God. Yes. Yeah, we talk about this yes. a lot. Yeah. I, I mean, my cousin who ended up dying by is so sad. It's, and I, but it's like he he carried this burden of having a uh, like dyslexia and he was brilliant. Yes. And he he went around the world fixing cryogenic tanks. And just, yes. and, you know, he had, had just, and That's I just, amazing. I remember this, like, he just so, like, to your point, how early on you're given a, you're given a label, you're giving it, you're given a diagnosis. You believe that freaking terrible story. And then, and then that's the, that it's like becomes what you expect, right? Versus saying, I, you know, I have a different way of learning. I, ha everybody has brilliance. In fact, I'm reading a book by Rick Rubin. I can't remember what it's called, but it's just like how everybody can be a creator and everybody can be an artist in this really not woo woo weird way, but like no, this everybody really is. beautiful way. Yes. And so when I think about what you're saying, don't tell me the labels, don't tell me the diagnoses. Let's figure this out. Let's liberate these people who have otherwise been um, marginalized. 
Yep. Oh my God, I love it. It's so crazy to see because immediately his goals, and this is why I asked that family question because that's really important to optimize for, especially with the girls. I haven't talked about the girls a lot, but girls are almost, it's almost worse, but it's the opposite problem. It's over-papered. They just go buy as many papers as humanly possible and then go, right. oh shoot. Well, because we're people have to work. We need to prove ourselves. But also we've been sold. The college, we are, we absolutely yes. are. But then the colleges and universities are super predatory and yeah. they know that we need validation. And they say so they yeah. sell us. They're like, oh, you need, oh a, my God. you need a graduate degree to prove that you're smart, to prove that you're independent, to prove that you're anything. And it's such crap. And it's and, and they and then they minimize women who want to be homemakers and they tell them, no, the only way to have a successful career or to have any kind of work where you can provide for yourself and have a, a skill set, too, that you should fall back on or anything like that is you have to buy a college degree. And that's crap. It's crap. And we're burning people's time. We're burning their energy. We're burning people who also the other thing is we're locking up potential entrepreneurs in student debt. We're locking them in. It's, mm-hmm. it's yeah, a jail cell. Yeah, the yeah, freedom. My, yeah. Yeah, yeah, no, I'm I I I I mean so much of what you're saying what makes sense. And I just I want to come back. I have a few burning questions and 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 a point or two. What um what I also love it, you you know, you've talked a lot about the economics as well as helping guide people to outcomes that are right for them. And I I was in prepping for this, I was saying to the to the our team that there I met um like an 8 or 9 year old boy a few years ago came to Indian family came to my house and the kid was like, "I want to be a neuroscientist." You don't even know what I mean, I'm like, that's wonderful. And I, I love that this is a really curious kid, but you you can't even know what a neuro... I mean, I barely know what a neuroscientist is. You know what I mean? And when I think about the pressure that our society puts on, and even us as parents, unwittingly, because we're really trying to help them, and you talk about this a lot in your clips, about expecting kids to know what they want to do when they've only been exposed to six or eight careers. I mean, hello, firefighter, doctor, lawyer, teacher, maybe what your parents have done, right? Maybe what your neighbor has done. But it's like we're expecting kids. And then, oh, not only is it enough to know what you want to do, you got to follow your passion. And if you're not really passionate, you are failing in life, right? And it's like, what in the world are we doing? And speaking of neuroscience, if what we know about how the prefrontal cortex is connecting with the rest of the brain developmentally is they are... I, I don't like to undersell teenagers. They are smart. They do know what they want. They do know what they need, but it will probably change because of yeah. how their brain functions. Yeah, like changes like over Hannah time. says, yes. your brain is still developing till you're 25 is, or even 30. I think the new this research is, is why. saying. If yeah. we need it, if we wanted to fix this, right? So there's so many. What I'm doing is fixing it, but if we wanted to fix it as a society, <laughs> if we wanted to fix this as a society, nobody nobody would be allowed to take out student lists to the 25. The, oh, that's I interesting. I've proposed this before. I was actually just on a live with RFK Jr. I'm not political myself. I actually don't know. Like, I'm not. I'm not a political person. I think that all politicians are gross. But I do believe that at a policy level, this really has to change because that's where that's where this is stemming from. This is like a the the laws the the laws that have stacked up to create this have been so damaging, and it's it, it is actually at a at an institutional level. And the the problem. With forcing, with forcing these kids to buy when they're not, their brains are not fully formed. So why in the world would we allow them it's to? Predatory it's predatory. Like I mean, it's almost per- like predatory lending, yes. right? I mean, we all hear these commercials. Yes. You can well, get five thousand yeah. dollars. Yes. You pre-approved. Um, you yes. can have terrible credit history, and we'll give you five thousand dollars. And then, and then you're you're really in the soup. Well, let me ask you this. You said in one of the videos that I just watched this morning, you said if I sound angry, something like this, I am angry. Hannah, why are you angry? No, no, and I, I, I think it's justified, but I want to, I, I want to tap into that because it, it feels like, like you will be giving I a, cry a, a voice. <laughs> to cry on your podcast. Cry, we cry all the time on this podcast. You, yeah, you would not be the first. <laughs> I, I'm, I am so. It, it's like it's because I get, I see all the fallout. I see the fallout. I see one these kids that have been handed to me because, like I said, I've just watched they've been clearly beaten over the head for their entire school careers. And I don't fault necessarily teachers and guidance counselors, even though they are the they are the ones executing this. That it is them, but it is policy. It is policy. They are told they have to do this, and when kids don't follow the policy, they have to come down on their heads because it makes it hard to do their jobs. And I get that. I do get that. But it is ultimately choosing to execute that is a personal it is one person it is an individual that is executing that stuff the system is made up of people right but what makes me really angry is seeing these kids that have been so damaged so pigeonholed so told things that are not true so told they have to buy permission before they do 
anything and I'm sick of it. I am sick to death of being told, no, you can't learn linear algebra. No, you can't learn calculus. No, you can't get into the medical field. No, you can't study law. No, you can't do this. No, you can't do that. And I'm just sick of it because we look like look at our society and I get not only the kids that I work with, at least they at least I can help them. Right. At least I can fix them. But I get people who are because I have to focus. Right. That's a big thing, too, about my business. It's so hard is I have to focus or I can't have impact. If I am just working all over the board, I cannot move the needle forward and the biggest way to move the needle forward is to keep kids out of student loan debt that will have generational impact generational impact if i can keep them out of this of this the hamster wheel if i can just say no no no, there's a better way because uh caleb the one i talked about after he got that job he's like i'm gonna propose to my girlfriend because he felt like he couldn't right that is generational impact that is generation of, and I'm watching these kids. I'm watching all their potential. I'm watching them lose steam. I'm watching them not be able to move forward because they've been told they can't. Every adult in their life is telling them that they can't. And then the other flip side of that is the people who write into me and say, I have so much student loan debt. I'm a pharmacist. I hate this. I had no idea. But what do I do? Now I have to make $150,000 if I want to change jobs. But I don't feel like I can learn that skill set because they think they have to go back to school to purchase and they're stuck. They're literally trapped in work they hate in lifestyles they hate because they have to pay off their student loan debt burden and there is literally no way out. And that is such a desperate situation that I see it crushes me. I've get some of the like if I could and I don't share them, but like sometimes I just want to read the messages I get because it, it like they keep me up at night. Like there's these people that their they their lives could have been so different. And anyway, I uh, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to break down and grow yeah, no, I listen, like you say, the system has failed so many people and for us as parents we just want the best what you know an air i mean we want the best for what we think is the best for our kids but so much of it is just so unconscious and that's why when we started this i just was like oh my gosh trend bucker renegade rebel i love you hannah for telling you know for helping people wake up to alternatives and realizing you don't know what you don't know but here you are doing this really beautiful important work you obviously care a lot like i called you an advocate and when I just when I think about the agency that can be handed back to people, yeah, right, rather than being living yeah. with the stigmas and the labels and the BS, you can say, hey, I'm willing to do it differently. And I even feel like some, you know, some kids will even they'll take that gap year between yes. high school and college. And I call any, it a career and, year. Career year. Oh, career I love year. Career yeah, year. That's wonderful. Because even that takes a lot of guts and chutzpah to say, I'm going to do it differently. And let's face it, that's what we're talking about. People who are willing to say, I'm, this is my game. It's my life. I'm willing to play it differently. It takes, a, and not just the kid, ideally the kid and their parents and their broader family to say, I'm willing to do this differently, right? For me, but I love how you're saying that that becomes contagious with some of the families and communities you work with, because when they're exposed to the, that as an as a really viable option, because I, I think you're you know, you talk about this too. Oh, you're going to sling wrenches. Oh, you're going to work at McDonald's. Well, let's face it. We've all heard these stories. Somebody starts at McDonald's. Next thing you know, they own 10 McDonald's and they, you know, it's like they're, they're really living the American dream without all the college debt. And I just think those stories are so compelling. And it's why I'm excited to have you on the show. And, uh, you know, I want to share um, your website is degreefree.com, right? Degreefree.com. Uh, degreefree Yes. Yeah. Yes. And then if you you'll you'll want to follow Hannah. She's brilliant on um, TikTok and Instagram at degree free. I still have a couple of other questions for you. If you got a few more minutes, go for it. But I just wanted people to it. be able to find you because I I just think what you're doing is is brilliant and so important. I want to come back to you're working in AI as well as building your degree free business, right? And I think yes. everybody's wondering. Okay, that's all great. If, if AI is taking everybody's job, now what? So what do you say to everybody who's saying to you? Because I bet everybody's saying to you, well, AI is going to take the job anyway. Now what do we do? So what do we do with AI taking everybody's job? This is one of the number one concerns that parents have. I hear this five to five to ten times a day. I get emails. I get questions. Um, so actually, and a funny story, I actually um, just now I am leaving that company. It was breaking my heart. I love. Oh, you're them. doing the right. I'm like, been... you gotta leave. More people need. I don't more have of time. You and more of. Uh, I don't women. have time. Yeah, yeah. yeah you got. I you had... got. You got bigger things to do. Yeah, and I love. It's been a very hard for the team, hard for me because I was like, I'm sorry, guys. I th I have to do this, and they're like, No, no, no. We totally get it. Please go help the kids. <laughs> That's what they just. They just. I just saw them all, and they just said, Oh, okay. I was like, All right. 
But anyway, uh, so basically working in that company for the last three years, which in AI machine learning time in the last few years is kind of an eternity, actually, because it's such it's the bleeding edge of technology. And so it's been very interesting because I am not I am. And I want to be very clear. I am not a machine learning engineer. I work in ops. I work in ops. That's 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 my that's my er arena. But fortunately for me, I've done some of I've helped train some of the models because at a startup, when you work at a startup, it's not a startup now. But when you work at a startup, you do everything. And it's great experience. Anyone who's worrying wants their kid to get in tech, find a startup for them to work at where they can learn everything. Um, and so basically, I am able to work with people who are industry experts, like extremely advanced data scientists, you know, are asked to speak on international panels about these types of things, build things that do not exist in those spaces, train models that don't exist, you know, write, uh, write giant write giant papers about how to fix uh, large language models hallucinations, right? Very deep into this space. A lot of things that parents don't understand is their children's job is not going to get taken by AI. Their children's job is going to get taken by somebody who knows how to use AI. And that's the biggest thing. Your, your kids need to learn the tools, right? A wrench is not going to up and take your kid's job. But, uh, you know, but somebody who knows how to use one is definitely going to. And that's what people need to need to take take out of that. The second thing is that people think that a college degree is going to save them, save their job from AI. It's not. It is not. If, you're, if your child spends four years in college and people jumped all over me for this, but I said colleges are actively against AI. They're actively against, they are, they are actually now that they've, once they figured out how to sell it, I saw somebody selling a master's degree. I can't remember what college this is selling a hundred thousand dollar master's degree program for AI. It's one oh, it's year, it's a one year uh, program. it's going to be obsolete in, in six it months. Is, already it was already obsolete when they published it. Yeah. The reason it was obsolete when they published it was because it was from a Reddit post. It was an open source Reddit. I looked at the curriculum oh, wow. and I was like, that is literally an, a Reddit post from a year and a half ago that I saw somebody create an open yeah, source and curriculum. Yeah, ChatGPT4 didn't lying. exist, it is, right? And also pretending, like the other thing is they, they're they telling their students not to use AI. Like it's cheating, except for, you tell me right now if you think those professors are not creating their lessons using ChatGPT and Gemini. <laughs> tell me right now if they're not. You know that they are. Uh, of course they are. It's an efficient way to work. And it's like telling these kids not to use the internet. It's the same thing. It's patently ridiculous. But anyway, uh, what parents need to know, though, is that what what is going to happen is I believe I have a very different view because of what the uh, the people who I work with who are, are actually experts. And they have a very interesting view. So our engineers say they have tried to automate their jobs away using AI. The best that, and this is what people won't tell you, this is not what Elon Musk talks about with sentient, with bio experimentation and linking it to human beings. That's a whole other, that's a whole other thing. AI, as we know it, is pattern recognition on a large scale. We can't work, we can't look at a thousand spreadsheets and understand based on looking at all those spreadsheets, human beings. I can't ascertain what's going on. I can't see patterns. I can't see things that are going on. That's what it is. And so what people are not realizing is that when they're looking at that, a lot of AI tools can only get to about 70% accuracy on things. 70% accuracy for building code is 0%. It's the same as zero. <laughs> and in fact, now you've made it harder because what's going to happen is you need now more devs to go through and find what the problem is because you have a building and you don't know what's wrong with the building. It's there, but it's not safe and nobody can go in as you figure yeah. out what the problem is. That now fine somebody... tooth calm. You need more devs. And so they actually think that it's going to create more. It's going to create far more dev jobs, far more tech jobs before it gets rid of them. And actually, we've seen this in our own business. So we leverage AI tools to do like reposting marketing, that kind of thing like that, you know, to just repost content on all different platforms and help us outline. We use it uh, to dictate podcast episodes and like outline it in a way that makes sense. Um, and basically, uh, what we've noticed is actually it's increased the amount of people we hired, not decreased. We have to, we're now able to push more. And so we had to hire more people. It's not, it's actually quite the opposite. And not only that, but this is kind of what happened with uh, ATMs. It's kind of what happened with uh, the phone camera, where at the beginning, and this is what all humans do with technology, we always lose our minds. We always say, this is the end of everything. Let's go to universal basic income. Let's, everybody's job is going to be gone. No. Uh, well, so what happened when the ATM was invented? They said, this is going to get rid of all the bank tellers. Oh my gosh, what are we going to do with all the bank tellers? More bank tellers. More bank tellers. It wasn't the ATM that got rid of the bank tellers. It was online banking, which happened decades later. Oh, interesting. So it's unproductive. Okay. Yep. Uh -huh. And then that didn't necessarily get rid of the bank tellers. They just moved jobs, right? Because now there's customer service. Now there's all these... It's like, it's just moving. The economy it's is a movement. Yeah. Around. And that's, I mean, but that's, yeah. uh, that's life. I mean, life is change and life is growth. And 
you know, I, I love the acronym for fear, false evidence appearing real, like, oh my gosh, it's just the, the, the worst thing is going to happen. And it's like, no, we are here to change and evolve. And I feel like if anything, what I, what I really try to um, instill in our kids is comfort and ambiguity, comfort in problem solving. And to me, you know, when I think about you talk a lot about kind of the helping people find these careers and so forth. But you, there was a, a clip that I watched where you were saying there was a young gal who wanted to be a psychologist because she was empathetic, she listened well, and she was a great problem solver. And I love you were like, perfect answer. You were like, those are skills that everybody needs and are always going to need it, right? And I think about those kind of, if you will, in air, and I put it in like major air quotes, because when I think about people being problem solvers, being comfortable with ambiguity, being empathetic, really being able to like really being able to listen, those kind of soft skills to me are going to become increasingly important in a in a world that is changing more and more quickly and where different disciplines are going to be coming together and different kinds of people are coming together. Those are the skills to me that I am, you know, I we look for at your tango when we're hiring people and the, you know, the uh, just I feel like the people that thrive here and, and thrive in most places have those. And if you can also code and you can also do something brilliant, um, weld underwater, well, great. <laughs> you know, then you've got like the coolest <laughs> job in the world. But it does strike well, me. And adaptability. Yeah. Adaptability. Like, yes. If we could teach totally. our kids one thing, it would be, Keep you learning. know, how to solve the problem and how to, I don't want to say think outside the box, but like how to be excited when things change. That is like here at Your Tingle, that's what we've learned. Like our best editors, our best teammates are like, oh, we have a new challenge. Let's figure it out. And and that's who rises to the top. I, I'm sure that's true in almost any career. I think it is. I think it is. And the last thing I'll say about that, too, because usually I address the tech side because people say, oh, all the tech jobs are going to be gone. And then I address the creatives because a lot of parents are like, my kid's artistic. Uh, AI is going to ruin art. I'm like, no, it's not. That's so ridiculous. It's kind of like, uh, and again, it's just all the fear mongering. If you look at the news, they're like, ah. Yeah, it's taking over the world. Everything's going to end. All the artists are going to starve. And I'm like, no, that's not what's going to happen at all. What's going to happen? Because we've seen this. The best indication of future behavior is past behavior. And so what we've seen was when the invention of the phone camera came, everybody said, oh, no, all the photographers are going to lose their jobs. No, that's not what happened at all. Now there's all these applications. The level of photography and the level, the base level that photographers are expected to have is extremely high. When did you ever see anybody spend forty thousand dollars on a wedding photographer 20, 15 years a ago? Thousand Never. percent. One of my good friends, right? her daughter travels around the world. She had a hard time as a, you know, if you will, an academic, tough time in school. Is this kick ass wedding photographer? People fly her all over the place. She is living her best life, making real money, going to Spain, going all over the place, doing beautiful work that means so much to the people getting married and their families. I just love these stories where it's like it doesn't have to be a zero sum game. It doesn't have to be you love your life and you can't make money or you, you know what I mean? Like it's like there. And that's, I think at the heart of your beautiful worth is back to, you don't know what you don't know. As you become more open-minded, more open-hearted with the possibilities for, for, and especially if your parents, for your family, for your kids and say, Ooh, what would really work? And let's really be open-hearted to that. That to me is game changed, right? And even back to the 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 connection between the economics and the emotional outcome, like you say, there's generational impact if you're late in, in debt, and then you're not getting engaged, and then you're postponing kids. All the downstream effects that happen because if you're late in debt, that doesn't feel good. That's stressful. Okay, um, Hannah, you got the last word. Oh, so the last thing I'll say is I just want to de-risk the situation for parents. And this is the biggest thing. I know a lot of parents are so concerned. Like if they miss, you're not, if you miss the exit ramp here, then they can always go back. They can always go back. And what exit All ramp? Because push. I could I could see it exit to college. Oh, college. Exit to, no, okay. they're pushing you right out, out of high school into college. And the FAFSA, that's the thing I've noticed. I've been told actually by and several on, parents. And the FAFSA is the... Um, Talk, just for the yeah, federal that student aid that. yeah okay federal student aid applications so basically what this is is an application a lot of states i've been reporting that certain people have been telling me i've been getting some tips about this i need to do some sort of investigation into it that their children are being required to so required to fill it out but that's not it they're being required to apply to at least three colleges to be handed the high school diploma which is criminal in my opinion it is criminal wait why like, why what? is that they're they're having to apply for re rewind the, to 
Say it again. I, I'm a little oh, confused. Oh, yeah. So I've been told from, and because I work with people in all 50 states, right? So I've been told from at least five different states that parents have told me that their children have not been allowed to hand, be handed a high school diploma. The high school will not give them a diploma unless they fill out the FAFSA and unless they apply to three separate colleges. They have to. Even if they that's, say, I'm not going to go. The reason I don't know how that's is because civil. When, you, when you apply to colleges, you are 93% more likely to go. They want you to buy because it makes the school look good. It is terrible. The incentive structure we've set up is horrible. So what I'm telling the parents is there is no pressure like this because your child, the NCES data on this, National Center for Education Statistics data on this, I'm trying to de-risk this for parents because I know it's so scary and I know it feels like, oh my gosh, it's the end of the world if they don't go. The NCES data last, this was this was last year, they said that the average cost of a bachelor's degree is $104,000 for four years. If your child doesn't graduate in four years, which 60% of kids do not, 60% of grads don't, they take five and a half years. At that point, the cost increases, average cost, $156,000. Tuition, interest, lost wages, all in cost of a bachelor's degree in the United States as of 2023 per the National Center for Education Statistics, not my data, $509,000, half a million dollars. Do not let them push you into a do not let them push your child into a five million five hundred thousand dollar bankruptcy efficient. exempt yes mm-hmm. and it's like your child when your child is 25 i'll go back to this when your child is 25 guess what they can go back at that point when they fill out that fafsa they will not be dependent on your income they will be considered separate from you all of a sudden the cost shoots through the floor because they can't be predatory on both the parents the largest group taking out student loans right now is grandparents because they tap the parents out it's kids parents grandparents that's what's going on. We are now pulling from, we are now, we are reaching to the retired who need that money for healthcare spend, right? And retirement, we're going into their pockets because the colleges have gotten so out of control and they will not get under control unless people stop buying. Your child can always, at any point, go pay a college to take them at any point. At any <laughs> right, point, exactly. If you want that, it's a that business. will still be up. Op- yeah, that. Yeah, they and, will and always a- take your money. Always. Yeah. 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 So don't be pressured into this by the graduation deadline. But the big thing is make sure your child's doing something. Put them into an entry level job. Your child wants to be a book editor. Go find them an entry level copywriting job. There's local publications like I just talked about this on on TikTok, but just get them forward momentum. But parents have complete control over this. Parents can help with this. Parents are empowered to do this. And not to plug the book, but I will. This really mm-hmm. helps. There's yeah, you got to like plug this. the book. The degree free way. Like, this uh, two yes. workbooks, one for kids and then are young young adults and teens and then yeah, one it's backwards for i know but... parents it, it's so it's so sobering and and so heartening at the same time hannah right and i just i can see why you're angry and i'm glad right i'm glad that you you're so emotional and rightfully so because the impact on real lives and like you say even going into that you know what grandparent would say no if it's like but I want to go to the best college I can. What grandparent's going to say no? Nobody would do that. I wouldn't, you know, it's like, okay, I'll live with less. I'll eat, you know, I'll I'll quit eating organic food so I can help my precious grandchild live the American dream. And that's to your point. It's all market, not, it's not all marketing. I, I mean, there are great, there are, to be fair, there are some wonder, many wonderful outcomes for, for people taking the college route. And then at the same time, there are many really, um, you know, misadventures, let's call them, it, that didn't have to be that way. And to your point, yes. I think it really is, it's a capitalistic society pulling on hard strings, masterful marketing, causing us to feel as parents and as teens, when everybody else is just trying to get into the best college that they can, that we've got to follow the pack. And it's so hard to say, I'm not going to follow the pack. I'm going to do my own thing. That takes more chutzpah than most people have. And even and they don't even know that that's really incredibly an option, which is why your work is so important. So you think, I, I'm just going to be in a dead end crappy job. And that's not true. What you're proving is that isn't true. But I love how you're saying start early as parents. Help your, and you, again, your, your TikToks and Instagrams are beautiful. Like, hey, help them start doing things if it's editing videos if it's you know you can you can edit videos and make bank even if you're 16 with a really expensive software you know i mean lots that you were talking about um a a lawn care jobs a kid started a lawn care job at 17 and sold it at 18 i mean amazing but it takes that it takes that intention 
And it takes that willingness to get up and do it and get off the video games. I mean, and again, that's what a lot of parents I know we're facing. A lot, and a lot of the parents that or do I do QA am close to. Uh, what's that? What do you mean QA? Or, or do uh yeah, they can do they can basically be QA. They can look for bugs. They can look for problems. Yeah, in the video games. Like, yeah, quality, yeah. uh yeah, quality. Yeah, quality assurance, assurance yeah. And yeah. Yeah. So anyway, I could talk to you all day. Uh, we'd love to have you back on. Hannah, did I get your name spelled uh, pronounced right? Maruyama? You did. And actually, I'm gonna Andrea, no one has ever pronounced it correctly on the first try except for you. Oh <laughs> my god. Well, you know what? My married last name is Botnogger, and so I just like it is a that's a mouthful. So I you know, I, I work at it. Uh, or my family's name. I shouldn't say it's my, my last name, but my family's name. Um, but you're brilliant. Uh, and just give hugs and, and props to your uh, wonderful husband, Ryan. It's cool to see you guys as a as a couple doing something that's brilliant, that's important. Love to have you back on the show. Tell us how we can be helpful um, here at your tango and um, our show. And um, I, I would love to keep talking, but I think we got to let you go now. All right, Hannah, yeah. thank, thank you so you much. Thank you so much. Appreciate y'all.